Hello, this is the third episode of the chat chamber of RGSL. This time we welcomed Tom Rostox, who is an associate professor and visiting lecturer at RGSL. He's a specialist in security and defense issues. This time we touched upon topics as Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, Belarus, United States elections. We also talked about why he chose an academic career, what is the impact of technologies on public information, as well as what is the future of geopolitics. Have fun and enjoy. This is the third episode of our GSL podcast, The Chat Chamber. We are very, very happy to be here with our professor, Tom Rostox. He's a very prominent Latvian professor regarding foreign policy, international relations, security, and uh, things as such. Yeah, so we'd like to uh, introduce ourselves again. Yes. <laughs> so um, we are both the law and diplomacy students, uh, Marta Willem and uh, Christopher Skalin Schlibenis. And we would like to start um, this wonderful podcast interview. So um, I would like to start with a question. And um, this question starts with a quote from uh, the very controversial polit politician and diplomat, Henry Kissinger. And he has a lot of quotes, and uh, especially from his famous book about diplomacy. And um, one of the quotes I would like to refer to is, it is not a matter of what is true that counts, but a matter of what is perceived to be true. And uh, when I prepared uh, this question uh, and uh, looked particularly for a, a quote, it caught my attention because I personally feel that it can be uh, uh, referred to what is happening in the world and what people are in general. And especially that now today in politics and mass media, we can see that there is a false information fake news and um, how do you look at this fake news tendency nowadays and uh, mani mani manipulation with people as tools for security threat making? Um, I, I think that there's, uh, there's nothing new with the, uh, with the willingness on the part of political leaders and, uh, and other actors to, to manip manipulate information. Uh, what I think is new is the, uh, is the extent uh, to uh, to which this has uh, been happening. Uh, and um, also I think the technological uh, tools are uh, relatively uh, new. Uh, for instance, when, uh, when I was a, a 10 year old, uh, 10 -year -old kid uh, <clears throat> uh, growing up in Soviet Union uh, still, um, when, when Latvia was part of Soviet Union in late 1980s, um, uh, the, the problem was that, well, uh, we, obviously we had a TV set, but uh, during the day there, there was nothing there, you know, there were, there were no programs, uh, so there was, uh, we, were, we were not flooded with, uh, with information uh, uh, the way uh, people are uh, today uh, flooded with uh, information, and part of that is uh, also uh, uh, false information uh, or uh, or fake news. So I think that the the intensity of the flow of information is what really uh, makes uh, this age apart from uh, you know uh, previous eras of uh, disinformation uh, attempts. But uh, but the attempt uh, to manipulate information uh, it isn't really new. The willingness has been there. It's just that the, the tools are available now. So basically, it's not a new phenomenon. It's only new in a different level. Um, I think that in in recent years, uh, what what is new is uh, the brazenness of this. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that well, for instance, before uh, before Donald Trump, um, political leaders and uh, also other actors were a bit uh, afraid to uh, to tell lies at a grand scale. So, for example. Uh, it was raining on his inauguration day, but he had no problem telling afterwards that it was a bright sunny day. Mm -hmm. So the brazenness is uh, is also uh, difficult, and uh, and I think Trump has set an important precedent uh, by um, uh, by telling so many lies uh, in uh, in recent years. So so this kind of a confidence in his uh, words is the is the thing that attracts people in a sense. I think to a certain extent, yes, but, uh, but, but the political leaders were, uh, were afraid to tell things that were blatantly not true. 
Uh, and, uh, and then it turned out that it didn't matter. You know, you, you could tell lies and people would still support you. Not in every country, not, uh, not everyone uh, who would attempt this uh, would benefit from that. Uh, but, uh, but I think that uh, the, uh, um, there, there are a few examples where this has worked and um, there will be other actors who will try to exploit that. Okay, interestingly, because um, now we will go a bit more specifically about this. Uh, and um, two days ago, BBC referred to Karabakh, um, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And there was an issue that they referred that it has now become an information war. We know that this whole conflict is referred as frozen conflict because it's going on for many, many years, even decades and hundreds of years. And um, what kind of intention is under this from foreign policy perspective, why they are doing this? Uh, and now, of course, Russia is uh, having some interest in that as well because it's very actively participating in that. Um, well, um, obviously, there's uh, the, the first casualty during any war is truth. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, uh, refers to um, all sorts of military conflicts. And um, uh, uh, there are things to be gained by occupying a more or higher ground uh, during a military conflict. If, uh, if, for instance, you admit that you have committed atrocities, well, you know, things may change over time and uh, you may end up being, you know, uh, tried uh, for, the, for the war crimes. Yeah. So it's safer to say that uh, you, you have not committed any war crimes. And it's always safer to, uh, to accuse the other party of uh, committing uh, atrocities. Uh, um, so, uh, there's, um, so there's uh, obviously something to, to be gained for that because uh, eventually uh, the, um, um, there are financial interests uh, involved as well. So for example, after the relatively brief uh, war in 2008, uh, in which uh, Russia and Georgia were involved. Mm -hmm. um, so Georgia won the information campaign. Uh, it, it received a lot of sympathy. And later on, that translated into money as well. So there was a conference in which the states attended and they pledged a certain amount of money uh, for Georgia. And they, they probably deserve that. Um, uh, but, uh, but uh, Political leaders are thinking about, uh, uh, you know, their their story. If their story wins, they uh, they can get a few good things from international community and uh, and also domestically. Although during wartime, people understand that um, you know their um, the adversary will not be treating us with velvet gloves and uh, vice versa. But at the same time, uh, in general, uh, the public wants to feel that we're the good guys. So political leaders are telling them the story that they want to hear. So would you say that perhaps social media has been, uh, has had like detrimental effect to feeding this kind of a narrative to a general public? Be because beforehand, perhaps in these kind of conflicts, propaganda existed, of course, you know, for example, we can see that in the already first uh, first world war, where there is that we will fight for our motherland. The Germans, for example, are the bad guys. The French nation is the good one. But now, perhaps the social media aspect of it is is in a way heightened the con has con heightened the concern. Yeah, I I think what has really changed uh, changed is that. Because um, these social media empires, uh, they, they're companies, but they're, to a certain extent, we could, because of their monopolistic position, and, uh, well, Facebook is almost a monopoly. Uh, the, the same applies to Twitter and, um, and a few others as well. Uh, they're so big that it's impossible to compete with them. Uh, if you want to enter the market, it's just very difficult. Uh, and um, uh, what, what has changed uh, is that, uh, Normally, uh, governments, uh, at least still in 20th century, the governments uh, could, to a great extent, control the information that reaches their population. Mm -hmm. But because of uh, so, uh, the global nature of these social media companies, uh, governments 
can no longer shield their populations from uh, from uh, information coming from outside. So uh, it's it, it's uh, you know we can conceive of a situation where two countries are at war and the other country is feeding information directly yeah. to the other country's population and and governments don't like that uh, uh, very and very often that will be misinformation uh, but uh, but sometimes uh, there will be some elements of truth there as well and then the population will be uh, confused um, so uh, governments are furious about that uh, I would say societies are also unhappy about the possibility that their minds will be manipulated by a hostile power from uh, abroad I regarding a similar uh, question regarding technologies and, and as such do you believe that the so-called zoom diplomacy or Twitter diplomacy will have some uh, permanent place in international uh, relations? Well, uh, I would say that uh, political leaders have uh, traveled too many miles for, for all sorts of reasons. I, uh, you know, they, they contribute to climate change by doing that. Uh, and, uh, and even though it, uh, these travels could be um, they could be just, uh, justified, uh, but not all of them. And uh, I think that many, poli uh, many political leaders and, uh, and also diplomats, they, they, were they were tired of traveling. They, it, it was too often, it was too much. And uh, this, to a certain extent, is a welcome change uh, because it was possible to, to do meetings at a distance but uh, that, uh, that was not used to the extent that it could be used. So obviously I think uh, there will be international travel after this mm -hmm. is uh, all over, but um, at the same time I think there, there will be an element. So probably Zoom diplomacy uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, likely to stay. And uh, next question is more about uh, shifting to our neighboring country. Uh, Belarus, as uh, you know, not that long ago, there was this tremendous and um, news that mass protests are going on by opposition movement, and at the same time, Lukashenko is doing everything to become the, to stay as the last dictator of Europe. And uh, from again, uh, another neighboring country, Putin and uh, Russia, using its card on Belarus, that you will remember, we have Union State, and now maybe it's time to. Uh, actually do anything uh, possible and we can help you uh, to stay in power but we have our own rules uh, to make that happen and um, how do you see the situation and development of it uh, what can be the predictable course of uh, development and movement uh, in this situation well I think that uh, the uh, the standoff in, uh, in Belarus is a it's a it's a competition of wills and uh, we don't really know what's uh, what's going to happen, but uh, it's impossible for the for the uh, for the things to remain as they are in Belarus uh, in the long run, uh, because uh, uh, I I think that uh, obviously there there have been lots of speculations about what's what's going to happen in Belarus. Uh, so uh, originally, when I uh, looked at the protests, I thought, oh, this is tragic because uh, they're going to be arrested and they're going to be punished and uh, the, the protests will fizzle out. Uh, this hasn't happened, so two and a half months into, uh, into the protests, they are still going quite strong. But the regime is also, uh, uh, it, it, is, it has shown cracks. But it's resilient. Yes, but the regime is resilient as well. and. Uh, and uh, Lukashenko and his supporters, they, uh, uh, this is their last stand. And, um, uh, and for that reason, because so much is at stake, it's, it's difficult to predict how, uh, how things will uh, unfold in Belarus. But, uh, but I think this has been of uh, great educational value for, uh, for Latvia. I think that this has been an example where uh, uh, we have uh, understood that 
Belarus has changed a lot. Uh, perhaps most of us, we didn't notice that because we don't travel that often to Belarus. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have, most of us, we have few contacts there. And all of a sudden we were confronted with the, re with the reality that uh, uh, Belarus has changed. Uh, so uh, there's, uh, um, and, and I think that this has been a demonstration of uh, the, the limits of uh, autocratic power. In, uh, over the past 10 or more years, uh, there has been uh, democratic backsliding uh, in, um, in a lot of countries all over the world. But at the same time, over the past years, we have seen a lot of protests. We're paying a lot of attention to what's happening in Belarus, but there have been protests all over the place. Uh, Iran uh, and uh, Bolivia, France, uh, Be uh, Bulgaria, uh, and, uh, and other countries. So lots of them. And, uh, and I think that uh, this demonstrates uh, that this is, on the one hand, this is a, this is a never ending struggle. When people are in power, they want to remain where they are. And it's difficult to make them leave their positions in high power. Uh, and uh, uh, also, those who are in power and those who are moving their countries towards uh, more authoritarian regimes, um, they, uh, they should also understand that there are serious limits as to how far they can go. Because uh, eventually, there will be a rigged election, and um, people will feel offended by that. You know, uh, uh, I am a decently educated person, but my vote was stolen. So what am I going to do? I, I don't like that. It's, uh, it's an assault on my dignity, on my personal dignity. Um, and um, when, uh, when a lot of people decide to uh, go to streets, even more could could follow them, and uh, the results can be very ugly. So I, I think there's great educational value uh, in, in that uh, for for all parties involved, and especially uh, for Latvia because we've gotten used to our democracy. We've gotten used to the fact that you know uh, when I go uh, and vote, my vote will be counted correctly. Uh, it will not be stolen by somebody. And, um, and then people will look at what's happening in Belarus and they will say that, hmm, actually, it's important to have that opportunity uh, to vote. Interestingly, yeah, well, in Russia as well, you know, we have seen the last uh, few months uh, what Putin is doing with changing uh, the constitution and now having this ability to stay and remain in power for more years and uh, well I, this question is also referred more specifically about um, relationship between opposition uh, leaders and movements because we saw that in August uh, the opposition leader Navalny in uh, got poisoned <laughs> and uh, what what was the reason behind it because it's not like getting this person out of the way because he did not die. But again, it's hard to understand, was it the purpose to get him killed or being threatened? And um, how are opposition movements suppressed if they become large scale with a lot of followers, as in this case? Well, it's, um, when, when you look into these uh, mysterious cases of people being poisoned, uh, and uh, that is truly a tragic story, which, which fits uh, the pattern. You know, there's there's a long-term pattern. So, uh, Russian state in various forms has uh, has been poisoning uh, uh, its um, opposition leaders, uh, both at home and uh, abroad, uh, or poisoning or using uh, other means of uh, assassination. So uh, this is hardly a surprise that, uh, that uh, Navalny was, was targeted uh, this way. Uh, what I find puzzling is that, um, uh, that he didn't die, but maybe 
but maybe it didn't matter because um, um, a lot of people will think that, okay, so Navalny was poisoned, it was obvious that, um, that either there was a direct order to do that or it, was a, or it was the system which permitted for this kind of thing to happen. Mm -hmm. But um, so Navalny can uh, return to Russian politics uh, and even stronger as a martyr. Yes, he, he's a martyr. He, he's a survivor, uh, perhaps a chosen one. Yeah. But uh, at the same time, I, I think that there's a, the truth is more hideous. Um, and I, I don't pretend that I know what's true and what's not. But um, I suspect that uh, this kind of poisoning, the uh, the pain, the desperation for the person involved, for uh, for his uh, family, relatives, and supporters, uh, that it eventually may leave a mark on um, um, on would be um, opposition leaders, because eventually it's it's safer not to stick your neck out. Um, so uh, I think that it, 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 uh, there's been a, a common narrative in Latvia that people don't want to go into politics because then their face will be all over the news. They will become victim, yeah. victims of smear campaigns and, uh, and uh, eventually their, their family members can be targeted, not by poisoning, but by, um, uh, but by you know, uh, targeted media campaigns. Uh, and uh, people don't want that. And now think about the, the prospect of being poisoned. It is, um, well, that is, I suspect that's a terrible way to die. Uh, and, um, uh, or even that's a terrible way to survive because you get to survive to tell the story, but uh, at the same time, you understand that this can happen again, you know, is the uh, doorknob that I'm touching, is it safe? Is the water I'm drinking, is it safe? Is the, you know, are French fries perhaps poisoned? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and that, uh, that still has, uh, has an effect uh, on, uh, on people's minds. Uh, so uh, despite the, the optimism, uh, which, is, um, which stems from uh, Navalny surviving this poisoning attempt, I would say that the truth is uh, more depressing, actually. Mr. Rostovs, you are a very well-spoken, knowledgeable, witty, and charismatic person. These are great characteristics of a diplomat, in my opinion. Why international relations, foreign policy, and security, and not diplomacy? Um, if um, I have a thick neck, and um, I, I don't like wearing a tie. Uh, and uh, uh, so if, if I would uh, work for, uh, um, uh, for a government institution, I, I would have to do that a lot. Uh, so uh, that, that being, a, being a lecturer at an academic institution, it uh, spares me the, the, the torture of uh, wearing uh, a tie. But, uh, but I think that, um, uh, I, I think it's, it's important to, to acknowledge that we can uh, um, do good things for our country in a variety of ways. Uh, I, you know, the, the, some, of my, um, some, some of my study mates, they, they work for different government institutions and they contribute to, to this country uh, in their own particular ways. And uh, I, have, uh, I have found, um, um, a decent way to, to contribute to this country in my own way, uh, and um, uh, and uh, and also uh, there's um, uh, there's a uh, there's certain path dependency that uh, once you once you enter the academia, then um, you know moving into um, into government uh, can be. Uh, more difficult and countries have uh, very different traditions uh, with regard to that so for instance the uh, the American political and academic systems they uh, 
they, uh, they exchange. Uh, so you, you, you can start your career in academia and then you can uh, uh, move into um, uh, uh, administration. Um, so for example, um, one, of the, um, um, one of the academics who, who has made, um, uh, who has had a lasting impact on the, on the study of international relations is Joseph Nye. Um, I think he has worked for, uh, for academic government um, at several times in his professional career. I, th I think that uh, he did uh, work for the American government in 1970s and then in 1990s. Um, but, uh, but then uh, other, um, in other countries uh, things work a bit differently. And I think there's uh, less exchange between academic and uh, uh, policy-making environments in Latvia, but, but that's fine. I think this is a very interesting point because, you know, some Latvian pol political scientists have gone into politics occasionally, like Artis Pabriks or Ivar Siljevs, and, and they have been academics and then they chose to go there. So has the thought also stumbled upon you at some moment or another that you might involve yourself in politics, not in the future, but just generally. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if um, you know, we, uh, I think that uh, uh, I, I would have to look at what's uh, what's ahead uh, in uh, in my life, and uh, um, so if if all goes well, I have another. Uh, 25 to 30 of uh, years of uh, productive uh, work. Um, I could um, I could be of service uh, in an academic environment, uh, or at some point, um, if the circumstances are right, uh, my career path might change. Uh, and uh, and um, so it's safer to say. Um, Never say never, yeah. largely because um, Artis Pabrix, the defense minister, is um, has a PhD in political science, yeah. and uh, uh, URC Eops uh, also has a PhD uh, in political science, and uh, um, he's he's been uh, a great colleague uh, for for many years. He's uh, he's still a colleague yeah. uh, of mine, uh, obviously, because he's still teaching. Um, so I, I, I look at some of my other colleagues and um, uh, I, I can see that uh, this is a possibility, but, uh, but I, I don't think that this is something that's uh, uh, going to happen. Uh, I, I would say it's more likely that I would remain in the academic environment uh, because uh, this is where I feel very comfortable. It, it gives more freedom in a sense because you can explore the topics you want and not be uh, drawn to the situations which are just in in the status quo. Um, I think all kinds of jobs can be uh, exciting, um, and um, uh, there's certainly a benefit uh, in uh, when it comes to working for uh, for government because. Uh, um, you, you get to experience, you know, how important decisions are made, how policies are created, um, and um, uh, but but it is also rewarding to work in the academic environment because you are always uh, surrounded by young people, uh, and you look at them. At, at least I look at uh, my students uh, in, in such a way that I would look at them and I would think that oh. They have such great opportunities in life. You know, there's uh, there's some fifty, perhaps sixty years ahead of them, uh, where they would pursue different career path, and uh, maybe our path will cross at some point in future, and, and it will be difficult. Uh, uh, it will be interesting to see um, uh, how uh, how they choose their careers. Um, so. Uh, so it's very, very exciting uh, to uh, to work with students. I agree. If you have to choose, Trump or Biden? Um, I think it's a um, uh, it's a no brainer, um, and and largely the, the, the reason for that is that. Um, 
Um, I, I'm not saying that Trump, uh, Trump's administration has been bad for Latvia. Not at all. But um, I, uh, I have uh, serious concerns uh, regarding the direction in which American democracy uh, is, uh, is moving. Mm -hmm. Trump's open admiration of uh, leaders of uh, authoritarian countries is a great concern for me. If our allies are turning more authoritarian, then what's going to happen to us? Uh, so it's, uh, that's the question uh, worth uh, uh, asking. Um, and um, uh, uh, and and also what what I find uh, uh, quite concerning is the uh, it's not necessarily the content of uh, of policies because uh, if uh, if Trump wants to support American businesses by relaxing all sorts of uh, environmental regulations, for instance, I can understand that policy. I, I think it's it's a wrong policy, but I can understand mm -hmm. that. But uh, what what I find concerning is uh, the, uh, the 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 inability and uh, incompetence of uh, of um, the the present uh, presidential administration, because uh, they um, they they hire people and then they fire yeah. people. There's. Uh, there's uh, no continuity. There's uh, there's opacity with regard to uh, to decision making, and um, it it looks like um, there are some motives uh, that are part of the present uh, uh, U.S. presidential administration that are uh, very self-serving. So opacity regarding Trump's tax returns. So. And uh, do, does he have uh, enough money to pay off his debt? So these are all kinds of questions that uh, should have been answered uh, at least several years ago. And uh, uh, if Trump is in debt, for example, then it uh, opens up uh, possibilities for hostile powers to have influence on uh, uh, American foreign mm -hmm. policy and also on, on domestic policies. Um, so uh, I would say Biden, but um, but uh, it it doesn't mean that uh, Trump's administration has uh, has been bad for Latvia. What would be uh, what would you think would win in this election? Because one is that you we would like to have something, but you know the reality is what we saw already. I think that this was one of the concerns of 2016. That right, uh, you can have polls, you can have the academia telling one thing. But in reality, there is some kind of a divide, perhaps. Well, um, there's a there's a tradition of uh, uh, in, in Latvia to organize the Riga conference in uh, yeah. in autumn. Uh, so uh, four years ago, uh, the conference was uh, I think in mid October, and uh, and there was a uh, one panel discussion in which uh, there was a, a representative from one of American think tanks, and uh, during the discussion. I don't know the particular reason, but, uh, but he said something like, and the next president, whoever she is, <laughs> um, turned out to be wrong. Uh, and, and I think there are, there are plenty of reasons uh, for, uh, for Americans to, uh, to make a different choice uh, this time. But, um, but at the same time, then, uh, then you have to look into, uh, into specifics. Um, uh, for example, well, normally we think of the election uh, in such a way that, okay, uh, the person who gets more votes wins. Okay, but Hillary Clinton got more votes last time and she lost the election because of the way the American uh, uh, political system uh, is built. And uh, um, so one has to pay very close attention to, uh, to the so-called battleground states, mm -hmm. the, the crucial states the where states. it could go either uh, way. Yeah. And then um, um, yeah, uh, some of the uh, states with very small population, uh, they, they, they have uh, uh, a similar number in the uh, yeah. electoral college as uh, large states such as uh, California. Um, so. Uh, it looks like this time uh, Biden has a comfortable lead over Trump, but then there's a possibility that um, 
uh, that uh, because of um, the rather uncertain domestic situation in the US with the pandemic, for instance, yeah. um, the Republicans have been trying to uh, uh, to reduce the incentives or to, to make it difficult for, for people to go and, uh, and vote um, in, uh, in some places. Um, so uh, there have been attempts uh, to discredit the election uh, as well. Um, so um, um, so, uh, so I am, uh, I'm a bit um, cautious still. Yeah. If you look at the opinion polls, Biden has a comfortable lead, uh, but then uh, um, this, will, this will be a long election. So usually we get election results uh, on the same uh, evening. Uh, the, well, later during the night, we, we, know how, uh, uh, we know the outcome. Of the election, but uh, but this time it may take uh, longer to uh, to find out um, uh, what the, who the next American president okay. is. What would be the best tip, maybe more than one, to the students uh, of IR, diplomacy, politics? What would you wish you known as a student back then when you were studying this? Um. Well, uh, before before I discuss any tips, um, when I was a student, um, I studied political science. Uh, I I started to study political science in 1994. So at that time, political science was um, very recently established in Latvia because y y you couldn't properly study political science in Soviet Union. A different kind of political yes, science. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You, you, you couldn't discuss, I mean, how do you discuss diplomacy, for yeah. instance? Uh, um, uh, obviously, there, there was uh, some competence on uh, international relations and uh, political science, uh, but, uh, but that was um, with a very specific orientation and ideological flavor. Uh, which a lot of people ignored. Uh, they knew that they always have to refer to, uh, uh, to how great the, the Communist Party is, uh, and uh, and then they would just you know do their analysis no matter the uh, the, the introduction. Um, but um, but uh, in uh, in nineteen nineties, uh, I, I think that the um, the professors were still learning uh, about a lot of things uh, themselves. Uh, uh, very often they were absent uh, because they uh, they would go abroad to study. Uh, yeah. You know, for for uh, they, they were going abroad for study uh, trips uh, to to Denmark, United States, Germany, and uh, and other places. Uh, so um, uh, so I would say that uh, the st students who uh, uh, study political science and IR today in Latvia, uh, they are in a much more privileged position because uh, their professors uh, really know what they're talking about. Uh, with regard to tips, um, I would say that, you know, when you're good, you, you, could, you have lots of options. It's, it's as simple as that. Um, if you're struggling, then your options are few. So um, uh, that is um, that is you know uh, that is one way to suggest that students take their studies seriously because uh, sometimes professors can recommend students, and uh, it, it usually it also works the way that the best students also get all sorts of opportunities uh, as well. As you said, they are the future colleagues. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and, um, uh, and, and also, I would say that uh, it is important not just to study the subject, but it's, it's also important uh, to use uh, the time of your studies um, uh, wisely. So obviously the focus should be on the studies, uh, but, uh, but then um, doing things which are related to the study process, like something that, that we're doing right now, 
it uh, it may um, it may bring additional benefits in the in the long run because uh, uh, you're doing you're doing something for the school. The, you're you're also uh, uh, learning about your uh, professors a bit more. Um, so. Um, Focusing on studies is one thing, but uh, but then there are lots of other things that that you can do, and uh, and eventually when uh, when you'll be applying for uh, uh, for jobs at some point, um, the, people will look at your CV and they will expect uh, to have uh, that, that you have a bachelor degree in something, mm -hmm. uh, but they uh, but they also look for other things. They they um, they. Perhaps they look at your internships. They look at whether you have spent some time abroad as uh, as exchange students. They uh, they look at uh, your um, experience with uh, non governmental organizations. So in general, have you contributed to a greater good? Uh, which is which is also significant. It it, it tells. Um, Another story about you, because most of the people who apply for for jobs after uh, after university, um, they they have the degree, but what else is there? Mm -hmm. And um, so these additional items are also fairly important. So we should seek opportunities, say yes to them, and and then try to also make new ones if if there are not many available. Yeah, yeah. Um, <sighs> Uh, so either you use the existing opportunities or uh, or you create them yourselves. Uh, we would like to ask another tip from you. Tell us, what is your prediction of how international power struggle will change? Why so? Because we would like to know which language you would suggest uh, learning. <laughs> um, irrespective of uh, uh, who wins the... Uh, Global uh, competition. Our closest neighbors will still be uh, Lithuania and Estonia. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but they speak English yes. for the most part. Uh, so so that's uh, that's not a problem. Uh, with regard to uh, other languages, uh, I would say that uh, you know uh, pick some of the big languages. Uh, 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 unless you, um, unless you, for instance, want to move to Norway, because of the spectacular nature and uh, the, the welfare state and other things, uh, then obviously you learn that uh, that language. But uh, but apart from that, so English is uh, is a must have. But uh, besides that, uh, uh, it could be any uh, any other language. But with regard to the uh, Competition, ongoing competition on the on the global stage. Um, China's economy will soon be bigger than the, the economy of the U.S. And uh, at least for the time being, it means exactly nothing. You know that's that's an indicator which is based on uh, the uh, how GDP is measured. Uh, you should ask questions like, well, why is GDP an important indicator of uh, economic or military power for that matter? Uh, and uh, China's problem uh, still is that it, um, you know, in terms of GDP, it will supersede the United States uh, fairly uh, uh, quite soon. But that's not going to happen in terms of military power because, you know, those uh, aircraft carriers, which were built in 1970s and 1980s, they're still in service. At least those that are built yeah. in 1980s, they're still in service. So uh, it will take China uh, a few decades to become a peer competitor in, uh, in military sense. Uh, but by then, it will be an, uh, it is already an economic, major economic power. Um, it, it's likely to grow in the uh, in future, uh, but, uh, but, um, when it comes to um, uh, to military power, there's uh, there's a very very long way to go for for China. Well, if we touched upon China and we 
do see everywhere in the world impacted by COVID-19, right? Uh, to economy, to power politics, to everything, because it's, it's there. And we don't know for how long, because pred predictions are that the COVID will stay for at least five years to eliminate uh, the whole impact it has made. Well, it may take even longer. Mm -hmm. And um, we, where is the, the root? Can it be said that COVID-19 was planned uh, to make a shift, to make an impact on the world, to, to the, every country to some extent showing, because we can see that there's a control by like the governments are controlling the society they are putting limitations but it is purposeful or it's it's controlled or it's just because we have to actually you know say to save ourselves our health um eventually um some of the countries will emerge from uh, the covid pandemic in a better shape than others um you know, um, our aim in life is to, uh, you know, to to heed the advice of uh, uh, of uh, you know, epidemiologists, um, people who know what they're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, so uh, if uh, if we do sufficiently well, we may emerge um, less damaged than uh, than others. Um, so that's that's important for us. In 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 terms of uh, uh, great power competition, well, I think that uh, when when you look at um, you know that there are academic studies which address a specific issue that where you know people want to find out uh, why why did this thing happen. And, uh, and then they look for answers. But then there are also studies which try to look into the future. Mm -hmm. And uh, in virtually all of those studies, um, they, well, most of them, they mention that an epidemic is, is a possibility because there have been uh, minor outbreaks uh, in, uh, in recent decades. They were, uh, most of them were contained uh, well enough and they, uh, and uh, the disease didn't spread. So uh, if instead of uh, COVID-19, we would have uh, an Ebola epidemic, we wouldn't be talking here. Yeah, yeah exactly. uh, Because uh, the, uh, the death rate from that is just, you know, uh, uh, you know, when half of the infected people die, then it's, it's, it's far, far worse than, um, than, uh, the, uh, than COVID-19. Um, so uh, we didn't know when this kind of a thing would happen, but it was it was predictable that something like this uh, would happen. Um, in 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 terms of our uh, our freedoms and uh, relations with government, um, I think it has become um, widely accepted that. Uh, there are governments that are using this epidemic as an opportunity to strengthen their uh, uh, the control of uh, their respective uh, societies. Um, sometimes that is done uh, for uh, for good reasons, but sometimes that's done for uh, for very bad reasons. Um, and um, uh, examples abound. Uh, also, um, I think that, um, you know, eventually a history of COVID will be written because we, we don't know the whole story. You know, uh, China uh, suffered from COVID early on and uh, now there are very few cases, but, uh, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't take those numbers at face value. Uh, because they might just be, um, uh, you know, spread for uh, for other purposes. So it's it, it's not surprising that governments are spreading uh, disinformation during the, the current pandemic. So basically, that like there is this virus, we have to accept it, we have to be careful. But how the governments, how the politics are using it, it's up to them. It's just like how every country perceives it and how seriously and what mm -hmm. are they
Well, I think that uh, in, uh, in, in some cases, the, the pandemic has been uh, used by an opportunity for political leaders for, for bad reasons. But in some cases, you know, when governments pursue competent policies, uh, then uh, society will eventually see that uh, political leaders did a good job. Uh, so that, that might build um, um, public trust in, uh, in government. And, uh, and that is certainly the direction in which uh, we would like politics in Latvia and state society relations in Latvia uh, to move. Uh, if, however, um, the, um, um, there will be increasing bitterness in society about how the pandemic was handled, uh, then, uh, then we will see aftershocks uh, once once the pandemic is uh, is over. Uh, because, if, for instance, if you look uh, at um, what has happened over the past fifteen years uh, in um, in the, in some of the countries, then uh, uh, there was the uh, global financial crisis approximately between two thousand. 7, 2010. And, uh, you know, in about four, five, six years time, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's a, a surge of populism in, uh, in a number of states. Is that, are those two things related? Well, probably they are. They are. And uh, there will also be medium term uh, after effects uh, once, the, uh, once the pandemic is over. But of course, the, the scary prospect is that you know, we're, we're looking forward to, um, uh, to a vaccine uh, eventually uh, being available. But uh, it, it might also be the case that if, you, if your immunity against COVID only lasts a few years, a little bit less, a little bit more, then uh, uh, COVID-19 will stay with us um, uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we would have to take these uh, vaccine shots once in a while, and then there will be people who, who think that, okay, vaccination is bad. Uh, we, we, we can't let this happen. So uh, they will contribute to COVID, to, to the pockets yeah. of COVID in, uh, in our societies. So this may end up being a, being a never ending story. And if that is a never ending story, then um, you know, we, we can say goodbye to things such as you know, a handshake, for instance. Uh, uh, so there will be all, all sorts of good reasons why people would stop doing certain things. And uh, that would affect a number of industries and, uh, and professions, uh, airline industry and hospitality industry obviously being, you know, hit the hardest. We see that history has a lot of entertainment in it. What is your favorite historical period or event? Uh, tell us, why do you hold it dear? Perhaps there's a lesson. <laughs> uh, there are... Um, We, uh, we as human beings, we try to learn from history, and uh, and some of the um, uh, and by the way, I don't know much history. I'm I'm very bad at that, but I I do know some uh, some recent uh, history mm -hmm. through uh, case studies that I uh, teach in my classes, and um, uh, some of the uh, some of the case studies are great successes of uh, foreign policy decision making and some, uh, some of them are great failures. Uh, they are all very instructive, uh, but, uh, but the problem with that is that on the one hand, uh, I would say that um, careful study of history and uh, careful study of case studies uh, is very helpful because it helps us understand the dilemmas uh, that uh, decision makers uh, face. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, um, there's also great potential for learning the wrong lessons. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, also, uh, history may not repeat itself uh, exactly. Um, um, so, um, I, I'm also a bit skeptical about uh, learning from history. So on the one hand, I think it is useful, so I'm, I'm a bit uh, 
you know, I have mixed feelings mm -hmm. about this. So on the one hand, uh, uh, it's useful, but on the other hand, uh, our ability to uh, to learn properly from uh, historical case studies is uh, is limited. So. Uh, what has been the stupidest, funniest, or the most unrealistic theory uh, or research that you have read? I think as an academic, perhaps you have stumbled upon something. <laughs> um, uh, I think there are... Uh, uh, no, it's, it's easier to attack some of the, uh, some of the academic theories. And, mm -hmm. uh, and honestly, uh, some of the stuff it just doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, um, usually students are not confronted with that stuff because mm -hmm. uh, we carefully uh, filter, filter it through. Yes, yeah. uh, we, we filter things that we're, we're, uh, we're giving to you as, uh, as reading materials. Uh, but uh, I think uh, there's, um, there's, there are a few things. Um, well, and actually, when it's easy to to see that the theory is wrong, it will not do much harm. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the the worst academic theories are those that we think they are true, but in fact they're uh, they're not. Um, and uh, there are theories that appeal to uh, to our understanding of the world, and uh, and we think that there's something there mm -hmm. um, until. You know, American academics run um, quantitative tests, and then it turns out that uh, that's it's completely wrong. So, for instance, uh, uh, the the clash of civilizations thesis is oh, yeah. one of one of those uh, academic theories. You know, it just it makes so much sense that oh, there's conflict across civilizational borders, so there must be a lot of it. And as a consequence, there is less conflict within those civilizations. But then, of course, you know, um, civilizations are usually in close proximity. But and we also know that, you know, historically, um, societies that have been uh, in close geographic proximity, they have been at each other's throats uh, most time. of the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, the American academics have run uh, statistical tests, and the, the clash of civilizations is uh, is wrong. Uh, it, it's it's wrong. Uh, there there's something in it. Uh, it's it's an interesting theory, but uh, but there's no um, support. Numbers don't support this uh, theory. And then there are and then there are a few others. I think uh, uh, during the Cold War there was. Um, uh, one appealing theory was um, uh, was the so-called domino theory. Um, so, great powers have commitments in all sorts of in all parts of the world, mm -hmm. and uh, very often their thinking about uh, their commitments is guided by this assumption that if we let one domino fall, then the rest will also fall, and that's just wrong. Uh, things don't really work that way. Um, uh, so, uh, when countries are, uh, when states are confronted with external threats, they try to balance. That's that's a general rule, unless the circumstances are uh, exceptional. Uh, but uh, but uh, but the, but the thinking very often still is that uh, oh we 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 uh, we have to uh, take a firm stand on all sorts of issues, mm -hmm. uh, while in fact. Uh, more flexibility is uh, possible, and then of course the uh, the, the most uh, uh, it, it, it's not a specific theory, but there's this assumption that uh, you can transform international politics. That all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, uh, all sorts of things will be possible if if only you, you manage to convince others that constructivism. Uh, not necessarily. I think it 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 has to. Uh, the roots of this idea uh, are in the interwar period uh, in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So you can really transform international politics, and uh, uh, but but also constructivist uh, uh, ideas are uh, are present uh, there. So, for instance, 
If the United States and China would come to a conclusion that they are no longer adversaries, then you know the, that will the be a different that. world. But how possible is that? You know, is 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 this really something that can happen in our lifetime? And uh, uh, I just uh, I just don't think this is uh, uh, I just don't think this is the case. Obviously, future diplomats have to think that they uh, that they can transform the world uh, through uh, diplomacy and uh, careful cultivations cultivation of relations between states. But um, but I think that this um, the the our ability to change the world is uh, somewhat limited. All right, so uh, perhaps one of the last questions. How did you get involved with the RGSL? Uh, what have been your observations and conclusions? How is this place different from others? Um, I think um, every academic institution is uh, different. Um, I would say that um, RGSL is a very modern um, uh, institution. Uh, it is also quite flexible because it is relatively small when compared to, to larger universities where, which have uh, you know uh, also hard sciences you know you, you have biologists and uh, uh, mathematicians running around uh, and, uh, um, and and those institutions are a bit more rigid so RGSL is uh, more uh, flexible mm -hmm. Uh, and um, I think it's it's also a well-run organization. Um, it um, it offers higher education, which is relevant, um, uh, and um, and there's um, there's clear thinking behind uh, the programs that are introduced here at uh, at RGSL. But um, I became involved uh, with the, with RGSL. Um, uh, when uh, when the, the study program law and diplomacy was um, was developed, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, uh, I think right from the start there was this idea that I I will be the person who will teach uh, uh, foreign policy analysis. So um, this course was part of the original curriculum, and um, and I think I started uh, teaching this course back in two thousand. Uh, 14 or 15 mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, but then I also uh, I also became involved with uh, in teaching of the course uh, theory of international relations um, that course was taught by my uh, mentor professor Jeanette was and she was uh, she supervised my uh, my PhD thesis and uh, I'm I will be forever grateful uh, to her that she managed to uh, Guide me through the uh, process of, uh, um, you know, getting a PhD, uh, and uh, and then she, uh, because she had plenty of teaching obligations, um, she also had a had a number of research projects which were running at the time, mm -hmm. so she suggested that uh, at some point I take over the theory theory of international relations uh, course, and. Um, because of my uh, uh, respect for Professor Ozo, and I, I do hope that she's not disappointed with her decision to involve me in uh, in academic life in general, and also in teaching the, the the theory of international relations course. Great. Okay. So, do you have anything that you would like to comment or ask uh, to us or our peers at RGSL? Um. You know, I uh, I ask plenty of questions, <laughs> but during but, seminars. But that mostly happens during <laughs> seminars, uh, and uh, uh, and um, uh, well, one of your uh, one of your questions was about uh, the the things that I uh, like about uh, RGSL, um, and um, it well, I think that in um, in most courses that I teach. In RGSL and yeah. uh, and elsewhere, uh, there are always students are very active and uh, and very engaged. Uh, but I think uh, RGSL is uh, is really characterized by the fact that uh, um, the seminars run very well. I 
I would always like to have more participation from people who, uh, uh, who are mostly silent during seminars. Uh, but uh, but I, I know that I can always count on uh, people like you, <laughs> by the way, Thank you. Uh, who, would, uh, who would read beforehand and who would be ready to reflect. Not just, uh, and not just reiterate things that are written uh, in, uh, in case studies or in, uh, in, uh, in whatever seminar readings uh, that, uh, that we discuss, but you would also be ready to reflect on those things in a, in a deeper sense, uh, so to say, that, okay, this is what's written, but then what are the implications of this? And you would be ready to, do, to discuss that as well. And that's, that's something that I like about this institution. So we should read more, we should reflect more, <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and be more active in seminars, probably. I think that would be just useful for many of us. Well, I think all of us, we should do more of everything. Yes. You know, I, yes. I, I should read more, I, I should exercise more, uh, and uh, we should do more of the good stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, uh, but I think we should also acknowledge uh, that we have uh, our own limitations. That you know, uh, that sometimes instead of reading more, I mean, maybe you should just go, go to the seaside, or, yeah. or you, maybe you should just go for a walk. Um, and, um, and I think that the uh, life is about discovering things about yourself. And uh, if if things work out correctly, then. Um, you manage to do right things at the right time. The most accomplished people are not always those that read the most. Uh, so uh, reading and learning is, um, is an essential part of uh, uh, academic and professional success, uh, but uh, uh, that's just not the only component. So we can, we can say a large thank you because this was awesome. I think it was amazing. I think you are a val very valuable addition to this podcast because of your expertise and, and, and knowledge in, in Latvian uh, politics and, and also linking this to the international sphere and really the ac academic rigor. This mm -hmm. is something that many would look upon you. And I believe our listeners will like it. All right. Thanks for having me. <laughs>